Hello there, and welcome back. I'm Martin, and today on Daddy Rolled a One, we're going to be talking about the Barbarian class as part of my video series on the history of early tabletop role-playing games, including Dungeons & Dragons. If you're new to D&D, you might not actually realize that the Barbarian class has not been a part of the game since the very, very beginning. In fact, it was almost a decade after the game debuted in 1974 before the Barbarian class made its official debut. Uh, there were some unofficial versions of the class before the official debut, and we're going to talk about those as well as the, the first official one. And why it was created and when it debuted, and then talk a little bit about how the class has changed over time through the various editions, um, even including uh, some of the stuff from the Watsi era. So let's start out by talking about 1974, D&D, the original box set. And this is Men and Magic. You guys have seen this book on this channel before. And as we've noted, there were only three character classes in this game at the time. That was fighting man or fighters, magic users, and clerics. Now, the fighting man doesn't actually describe it as far as what it is. It just kind of tells you the mechanics. But the idea of the fighting man, the reason that, the, well, first, it's a cumbersome name. I'm just going to say fighter. But the reason that it seems so generic is because that was exactly the intent. So, uh, just like magic users were intended to replicate any type of arcane magic using character wizards and sorcerers and warlocks and all the stuff that we have all broken um, into different classes now this was a catch-all so that's why this term is magic user someone who uses magic a fighting man or a fighter is someone who fights so that could be a, a paladin type a knight it could be a soldier a mercenary a man at arms it could be a, a barbarian okay so anybody who makes their way through life by um martial combat is essentially a fighting man so that was what this was intended for so there are no barbarians in this version of the game in this book now in monsters and treasure this is book two of the three book set we get into the obviously monster section and you see that there are berserkers which it says are simply men who are mad with battle lust and they uh, they only have fighting men with them and they fight as normal men but they add or when they're fighting normal men they add plus two to their dice score to hit um when they're rolling due to their furiosity okay so berserkers in this case are kind of like a version of barbarian but these are you know monsters okay so that's what we have for original D&D, &D, which is that we don't have barbarians in there. Okay, so interestingly enough, the first barbarian class that I was able to find uh, that came across in the D&D &D, uh, system is from 1977 in a magazine called White Dwarf. So this is published out of England, and it was sort of just in a generic way. It was the English version of of Dragon Magazine here in the US, okay? So in the uh, December, January, 1977 slash 78 issue of White Dwarf, this is White Dwarf number four, there's a gentleman by the name of Brian Asbury and he creates a barbarian class. Now, Brian was probably most famous for, uh, he wrote a lot of articles in White Dwarf, also in Imagine Magazine, uh, one of his monsters from White Dwarf made it into the Fiend Folio. That's the Zill, X-I-L-L. -L. Uh, but probably most famous in White Dwarf for creating this uh, alternate XP system uh, that debuts, I think it was in number five. So the issue after this one with the Barbarian. And uh, in that XP system, he talks about not just giving uh, characters XP for killing monsters and taking their gold. And, and the, you know, in this edition of the game, you got XP for the gold that you collected. So he talks about giving XP for, you know, defeating monsters, but not necessarily killing them, but also for um, accomplishing goals. Like if you reached your goal, you would get XP for that. So the way that we kind of use XP now, um, but that's not how it was done back then. And he's talking about this as early as like, you know, two, three years after this game is, is created. He's talking about an alternate XP system that would let you, uh, again, get XP for tasks that you've accomplished. So in this version of the class, what Brian has done is make the constitution score as the prime requisite for this character class. So at the time, the um, prime requisites for the classes were strength for fighters, it was intelligence for magic users, it was wisdom for clerics, and then dexterity for thieves, the thief class being introduced from the Greyhawk Supplement in 1975. 
So those were the, the prime requisites. No other classes were really using constitutions. So he makes a point of, of saying that, like, you know, the constitution score is almost kind of useless, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. And then says that, you know, but for barbarians, it's the prime requisite. But then he says that, well, that's the prime requisite. And, you know, they should have a high score in that. Uh, to operate really effectively, they also need to have a strength of 13 plus, a dex of 13 plus, an intelligence of 9 plus, and a wisdom of 14 plus. So you're starting to see, even as early as 1977, this idea that ability scores, which in here are really not that important, to be quite honest, in this version, uh, in, in the original D&D game. Uh, but now he's saying that like you need all these different scores in order to to be an effective barbarian, have these high scores, okay? So then it mentions that the character is going to save as a cleric, but at um, plus four. So at, like a first level barbarian is going to save as a fifth level cleric. So early D&D saving throws are kind of grouped into um, roughly groups of, of four levels. So a cleric of level one through four saved at one level. And then when they hit fifth level, their saving throws improved. OK, so this is saying that you're as a barbarian, you're going to save as a cleric, but like at the next higher group. OK, but then also mentions that they're two times as resistant to poison. So being stronger, they're being hardier and then does a really interesting thing with the hit dice. And this is a form of early game balance as people were trying to figure out how all these mechanics kind of work together mathematically. So in the original game, all characters had D6 hit dice. It didn't matter what class you were. However, very early on, a change was made and magic users and thieves were given d4 hit dice clerics are given d6 and fighters are given d8 and so he doesn't want to step uh, brian that is the creator of this this unofficial barbarian class does not want to step on the toes of the fighter class which is the only class that had that d8 hit die which was the highest one at the time and so uh, but he also thinks that you know the cleric hit die of die six isn't really fair because a barbarian should be hardier than a cleric. And so what he does is give them D six plus one hit dice. Now at first level, that's really the same average as getting a D eight, but it is distinguishing the barbarian as kind of being in between a cleric and a fighter, just for the sake of letting the fighter sort of stand alone and have that D eight hit die as one of their unique class abilities. All right. So there's some different things in here about armor. I'm not going to go through the whole detail like this for every every version. I'm just starting out with this one because this is the first one that we see. So talks about different armor and at levels one through five using shields only. But then at level six through ten, you can add leather armor. And then at le uh, level uh, 11 and past, you can start wearing chain mail and shield. Uh, but they will never wear plate armor, it says. And then, and then it says they're always counted as having armor as one level higher than what they're actually wearing. So... Um, um, that's just an interesting thing, but it's this idea that like the barbarian should be a lightly armored type of character. For weapons, it says that typically they would use a sword, spear, and hand axe. But then if you have a higher dex above uh, 13, uh, 13 plus, I think, um, then for each point that you have above 14, you get an extra weapon proficiency. And it says that you know, normally you would take a longbow or a two-handed sword or a sling or a dagger. It also mentions that the um, sort of fancy weapons, um, and it mentions the, I'm going to pronounce it, in the American English this time, unlike my other video on firearms, arquebus, uh, that they wouldn't use that, right? Because that, that's just not something that a barbarian would use. Okay, and then it goes on to the basic abilities. And now you're starting to see incorporating things from like the thief, right? So uh, it says that they listen as human thieves. It also mentions tracking like the ranger. So the ranger was actually part of an article from the strategic review. At this point, it hadn't been officially published in a book for DD. However, the assumption from this article is that people were reading a strategic review because it doesn't tell you how the tracking works, really. Um, it, it says it works differently from a range and the percentages are different, but tracking as a skill is actually explained in a completely different article in a different magazine from a different author. All right. Then it mentions that you, they sense danger. It's not really well explained. It says you can roll a D6 to sense danger, but it doesn't even tell you really how to interpret what that means. Um, and then it says, you know, they have fearlessness so that spells or magic design, des, uh, devices that would cause fear will actually um, the barbarian has a 50 percent chance of sort of going into a rage state. And then it says like a berserker, as we saw in the um, Monsters and Treasures book two of original D&D. So I found this interesting because while they don't 
call this ability rage. It's called fearlessness. It says in the text, in the description that the barbarian will go into a battle rage. And that's really the first uh, opportunity that I've seen where that rage quality is associated with the barbarian class. And again, this is an unofficial version, but it says that they're going to battle rage like the berserker. All right. So then they also have special abilities so that those were the basic abilities. That I just went over the special abilities are they have sign language, but only if they're intelligence nine plus they get something called first attack curiosity, which means that they're always plus one to hit if their strength is 10 or over. And then if their strength is 13 plus and their dexterity is at least average. So again, not very well detailed, um, but they're just counting on you to do the math. Then they get to strike, strike with curiosity, meaning they get a plus two to hit and do double damage. Uh, and that damage gets better with level. So it goes up to like triple and quadruple at higher levels. It's only for their first attack and it's only if they win the initiative. So um, again, that could sort of be thought of as being kind of like a rage type mechanic as well. It's just not called that. It's called curiosity. And then they have climbing as the thief class. And then they have the ability to catch missiles. And then there's a table that shows like how well they can catch missiles and based on their dexterity score. And very interestingly, the dexterity score is given exceptional ratings. Um, so if at 18, there's like percentages that go up, sort of like exceptional strength strength, but this is for dexterity and it's never explained, you know, why you would do that. It's just assumed that you would know. So then, uh, lastly for this class, there's a talk about magic and saying that any item, any item usable by a fighter or thief is usable by a barbarian, except for prohibited weapons and armor and that they're illiterate unless their, uh, wisdom is 14 plus and, uh, so what that means is that they can't read magical books or runes, which is good and bad, because uh, the good part of that is that then if those are cursed, they can't trigger them because they can't read them. Right. Um, and then really interesting uh, part of this. So they it never says what alignment they can or can't be. Uh, it never discusses the species or, or, you know, the races in the terms that they used back then. So because it doesn't say the assumption would be that only humans can be barbarians uh, because, again, it doesn't say that a dwarf, an elf, or a, at the time a hobbit could be um, one of them. The one that could be a barbarian. Uh, it specifically says that it is not a subclass. So by this point in time, uh, in 1977, we've seen the Greyhawk, Blackmore, and uh, I think Eldritch Wizardry supplements had all come out by this time. And all of them have subclasses in them. So the Thief was a separate standalone class, but then the Paladin subclass for fighters, you had the Druid subclass and the Monk subclass of clerics, and you had the Assassin subclass for thieves. So this is saying that they are not subclasses. The, the Barbarian is not a subclass. It's a standalone class. Um, interestingly, it has it requires less experience points than a fighter. Part of that, I'm guessing, is really based on the armor and weapon limitations, as well as the, um, um, you know, just some of the special abilities that they have and the lower hit dice. So uh, it's less than a fighter. And then lastly, they have some fun level titles here. So level titles were a huge part of the game in the original editions. And so these level titles kind of seem to be straddling the line between like this primitive society type. But then when you get to the top levels uh, at what we would call a name level, they're using, as the Americans would pronounce it, layered. Uh, I tried to do the British pronunciation and I couldn't quite get it down. So I'm just going to use the American pronunciation. But Laird is a Scottish term for a high, uh, someone who owns a state property, right? So it's, it's tying into that domain management as I discussed in my last video. So even in this, the higher level barbarians um, are going to reach name level. And there's a thought that like, you know, I, it doesn't really talk about owning property in this, but the title alone, that's kind of what that title means. And also it's sort of starting to associate this type of a barbarian with kind of like that Scottish Highlander type, just based on the title, which I thought was really interesting, but I guess it makes sense because this was written in an uh, English magazine. Now in White Dwarf number 12, which came out in April, May of 1979, 
Brian Asbury revises the Barbarian class based on advanced D&D having been published by this time and the player's handbook having come out. And so he says that he needs to revise the class so that it's no longer um, you know, compatible with original D&D, but so it's up to date with advanced D&D. And the way that he writes it, the assumption is that uh, because remember, there is, there is a Holmes basic set that is out during this time, but the Holmes basic set really is kind of that in-between area where it's sort of just a revision and a cleaning up of original D&D. And original D was supposed to kind of lead into advanced d and I know this gets confusing. Again, please refer to my video on the history of D&D editions of This is Confusing. But he talks about changing the hit die to D8. Uh, he gives them the ability to hide in shadows, which is new. Um, he clarifies the sense danger ability and he changes the first attack ferocity ability a little bit. And then uh, he clarifies um, the illiteracy uh, portion of the barbarians. And then he talks about how barbarians could technically be considered a sub race of humans. So, um, so instead of a subclass being like a sub race of humans, and then he says, but it's possible also for half orcs, which debuted in the 1978 player's handbook for advanced D&D. So he says half orcs could also be barbarians and they could work up as high as eighth level. So they're not going to get to name level, but they can work up to as high as eighth and they can multi-class as barbarian th or multi-class as barbarian assassins. Okay. So remember that's 1977. And uh, then this update done a little bit later, but um, these are all unofficial versions of the barbarian class. Okay. So unofficial just meaning that like, you know, they're not approved by TSR, which was publishing the game at the time. So there are other role-playing games that are coming out in the mid to late seventies. And I kind of just a quick list. This isn't, this isn't all of them. Okay. So it's just a quick sample of some of the more popular ones. So Tunnels and Trolls came out. It's a class and level system. It does not have barbarians at the time in the original edition. Okay, Rune Quest in 1978 is more of a skill-based game. So you can kind of create whatever character you want. Um, it's published by the same people. It's Chaosium that published Call of Cthulhu. So it uses that same kind of system. And uh, again, so more skill-based, not class and level-based. You have Dragon Quest comes out in 1980. It has classes, but not barbarians. You've got Fantasy Trip in 1980 as well, which only has two classes, a hero and a wizard. However, uh, it does talk about how you can take a hero and create um, different types of heroes, such as a barbarian, but it's not a standalone barbarian class the way we think of it in D&D. There's the Arduin supplements that come out in 1981 that does not have barbarians, even though it has other classes. It's kind of, it's sort of like a, um, you know, a, almost like a, a homemade fantasy homebrew of D&D. &D. And so it it's, it's basically following the same format, but like creating new classes and spells and races and things like that. You've got Rollmaster. This comes later, 1982, which does not have barbarians in it, at least in the original version. There's also books that are coming out that are, um, you know, collections of classes. So you have the Manual of Arania that came out from the same folks that developed the Thief class out of um, Arrow Hobbies in Santa Monica. So they got together and published a book of all new classes. Um, that does not include a barbarian class. And you've got the complete adventurer by Bard Games. This also does come out later, but uh, again, it, it's a whole list of classes. There's no barbarian in there. So just to kind of let you know what was going on, uh, I think it's kind of interesting that barbarians were such a huge part of the influential sword and sorcery fiction that um, came out that influenced the original creators of the games. You know, Gary Gygax was a voracious reader of, you know, pulp stories and sword and sorcery fiction like Fawford and Grey Mouse from Conan and things like that. And um, but didn't include a barbarian in the original game. And I think part of that reason, again, is because the idea is that the fighting man or fighter was intended to be a general class that could be used to emulate whatever style of warrior character you wanted to play. However, now we're, we're bumping up into like the early 80s. And it's very clear that because D&D is a class and level system, people are going to be creating classes. So there's been new classes that have come out in the supplements. Advanced D&D greatly expands the number of classes. And um, some of those are, you know, like paladins and rangers. They are subclasses of fighters. And so Gary writes an article in Dragon Magazine, number 63. This is from July 1982. Now, uh, I do not own this one, uh, unfortunately, in um, in hard copy, so, but I do have the PDF. And 
in this article, he talks about um, play testing a bunch of different classes. He doesn't say what those classes are right in this article, but he does say that the barbarian was pretty much the most popular of the ones and the ones that I think the players felt was the most balanced. And so he said, here you go, play test it yourself. And the implication is Gary wrote this. So this is now an official class and he's telling you that you can use this. And by official, what this means is that you could theoretically go to a convention and play in a tournament game and play a barbarian because Gary has said that this class is to him balanced and it's part of the game. Okay. So in his version of the class, there's some stuff that actually is similar to what was in that one from White Dwarf, but Gary completely changes it uh, based on, you know, new things that were happening at the time in the game mechanics. So there is no prime requisite and they do not gain uh, experience point bonuses. They do special die rolls. And as you see this chart here for how they generate their strength, constitution and dexterity scores. Apologies, guys, uh, for the uh, fire truck going by. Give me a second here. And I, again, I apologize for that. Uh, okay, so then uh, he also talks about um, increased AC bonuses for dexterity, but only if they're wearing non-bulky armor, okay? Uh, he does say that they are human only, so no other uh, species can be barbarians. They get a D12 for hit dice, which at the time was the only class that got a D12. That was higher than fighters and paladins, which had a D10. And mentions that they get minimum seven at first level. So if they roll a D12 and they get a one through six, it's just mins out at seven. All right. He says that they can use any armor and weapons, but then again, they do get that dexterity bonus if they're wearing non-bulky armor. Okay. And then for alignment, he says they can be any non-lawful alignment. So this is a big thing in advanced D&D, &D especially different character classes had alignment restrictions. So paladins could only be lawful good. Rangers could be any good. Monks could be any lawful. Barbarians in this one can be um, any non lawful alignment. And then they have their tribal language or national language and common, but then they would need to learn how to read and write in order to be, um, you know, literate. And then they do not use alignment languages, which is another part of early D&D, the idea of alignment languages. Uh, for special skills, they can climb trees and natural services, and they can hide in natural surroundings. So those are very similar to thief skills, but natural surroundings, not uh, man-made structures. And then for secondary skills, they have survival, first aid, outdoor craft, and tracking. Barbarian also gets tertiary skills and they get one or more of these depending on their locale and the culture that they come from. So animal handling, horsemanship, long distance signaling, running, which is double normal speed for three days before you have to rest at like go at normal speed. Uh, and then the ability to uh, craft a small watercraft, like build and then pilot, whether it's paddled or, or um, other types of small watercraft. And then you have sound imitation and you have trap building. So just an aside, it, it, as you're reading through these, you might want to check out my video on the history of skills in D&D &D, um, because we're starting to get close now to this point where because Gary is putting all these different skills and he's calling them skills into this barbarian class and you've got these these skills by saying that the barbarian has skills in animal handling and horsemanship the implication is well then what do other characters do if they don't have those abilities? Does that mean that they can't do that? And um, I go into a lot of that in my history of skills in D&D, &D, which is eventually where you get to the creation of an all-out skill system it was originally called non-weapon proficiencies, but that's just an aside. All right. Then they also have special abilities and defenses. So you've got basic abilities and special abilities, and you've got special skills and secondary skills and tertiary skills. And so now you have your special abilities and defenses, which are, um, you know, surprise, whether they can be surprised and surprise other people. They get a back attack, uh, which is a defensive mechanism. So uh, if a thief essentially or somebody assassin maybe tries to attack them from the back, they have the ability to react better um, because they, they can sense the person's sneaking up on them. They get leaping and springing. They can detect illusions and they can detect magic. So this is the only class, uh, at least up to this point in advanced D&D or in really D&D in general, of officially published stuff that does not have um, different level titles for the different levels. So the level title for every level of barbarian is just barbarian and that's it. So interesting. Um, people say this class is unbalanced and it kind of is it's it's a lot more powerful than other classes part of the problem with that is that 
early editions of D&D classes were pretty much all front loaded. So all that stuff that I just read to you that the barbarian gets, they get it all at first level. It's not, you know, it doesn't come out like, you know, slowly over time. So, but the balancing factor of that is that the barbarian class more than any other class in advanced D&D requires so much experience points. So they require 6,000 experience points to get to level two. The fighter requires 2,000. The magic user requires 2,500. People say magic users are more powerful, but the barbarian class is almost three times as much experience points to get to second level. So that was the balancing factor was that they're going to be languishing behind and the fighter is going to be, you know, uh, almost fourth level or whatever by the time the barbarian just gets to second just because of the experience point gap. Okay, so that's the article from 1982 in Dragon Magazine number 63. Now, eventually, you know, there are no barbarian classes in the player's handbook from 1978, but it is finally published in this book, 1985 under Earth Arcana. There's a lot of reasons that this book came out. I'm not going to get into them right now, uh, other than to say the short version is the company was in trouble. TSR was not doing well. Gary had been out in the West Coast trying to get a movie made that didn't happen. And um, he comes back and basically throws this book together, which is 99% of it is articles that have been written in Dragon Magazine, like the Barbarian class. And so it's pretty much picked up um, almost exactly as it was from the article in Dragon Magazine. So you can see here, like it has all those abilities and things that we were talking about. And it's, re it's uh, repeated here in this book. So this is 1985. So this is the first time that the class is in an official rule book for D&D. Also in 1985, comes out a little bit later, but there's this book. This is Oriental Adventures, 1985. Says it's by Gary Gygax, but it's pretty much general consensus that it was written by uh, Dave Zeb Cook. And Gary Gygax's name is on the, uh, as the author, basically, because he was the more well-known person and they wanted to sell more books. So I have to be very careful with this one because you see it's, it's, it's my only book from back in the day that's falling apart. But this book does have a barbarian class in it. So it's called an Oriental uh, Barbarian. And it says that it's very different from the Barbarian in the um, Unearthed Arcana book. So it's actually not that different. But one of the things you'll notice here is that it lowers the experience points from 6,000 to 4,000. And they don't get the tertiary skills. So they don't get all like the first aid and all like the horsemanship and all that kind of stuff. Like that is not part of this. And I'm guessing that's just why, because pretty much everything else is very, very similar. So they take that out. Um, it does talk about there's different kinds of barbarians. So there's forest, there's jungle. And there's, um, you know, I, I guess it's just those two. Oh, Steplands, sorry. Steplands, Forest, and Jungle. And um, so it describes them that way. Uh, but again, that's this is 1985. Okay, so this is about four years before second edition Dungeons and Dragons comes out. All right, so second edition D&D does come out in 1989. However, there's an article in Dragon Magazine number 148. So this is from August of 1989. And in this article, um, even though second edition has come out uh the author of the article uh, is talking about the first edition barbarian and in here uh, basically what carl uh, waller does he uh updates the barbarian and kind of takes away some stuff he takes away like detecting the illusion and detecting magic and things like that great illustration there and uh he, he kind of tones it down a little bit and does a revision of the of the barbarian and then he does all these cultural things like he talks about how there's foot nomads and desert tribes and there's mounted nomads and there's northmen and highland clans and sea raiders and all that kind of stuff so that's a really fun article if you can get a hold of it has a lot of good ideas even if you're playing 5e okay so we talked about uh that edition uh, article which is great and then second edition 1989. So now we're moving into the second uh, or, you know, the, the last decade roughly of TSR's existence before the Watsi uh, acquisition. So barbarians are not a class in this particular book. So um, which is interesting because at the time, like I, I was really surprised because you had Unearthed Arcana having come out which introduces barbarians, cavaliers, and thief acrobats as new classes in the game. And then you get to second edition. Now, of course, Gary was gone by this point, so that could be part of it. But um, they excised all of those classes from, from the book. And I kind of thought, like, wait, why, why are we getting rid of classes that, that are brand new-ish? You know, they were only four years old that had been introduced into the game 
to expand things, and now they're contracting again and taking them out. This also removed half orcs from the book. Uh, they removed monks from here. They removed assassins, and then uh, and then all those new classes were gone. Okay, so it does talk a little bit about fighters and you know what a fighter can be like, and so you know they. Uh, the idea is, you know, you could play a barbarian type if you wanted to um, play a fighter, but they're kind of aligning it more with sort of like the tactics and the strategy and being more of like a military leader. That's kind of what a fighter in this particular book is kind of like, uh, at least how they describe it. Right. So there's no um, barbarian in here. One of the things that second edition did was this concept of these complete books. So there was a complete handbook for each of the character classes and then uh most of the i think all of the races and then they start expanding on them okay so this uh these books introduced this concept called kits and there's a kit in here so a kit was essentially it's think of it like a 5e background that's not really what it is but you know i'm just going to use that as shorthand because i, I don't want to get too much into the weeds on that um but they have all these different warrior kits that you can take uh if you're if you are a fighter okay and one of those kits is a barbarian. So you see it here and it describes what a barbarian is. And um, then it gets into things like, you know, what's their role and what their secondary skills would be if you're using the secondary skill system, what their weapon proficiencies are and non-weapon proficiencies, which again, those are skills. They just call them non-weapon proficiencies. And then what kind of equipment that they would use and then what their special benefits are. So here's what's interesting. The special benefit of a barbarian is that they get a bonus on um, their uh, reaction rolls when they're meeting with people, uh, it, depending on how they roll. And then their hindrance is that they get a penalty if they roll really, really poorly. So it, that's it. That's what you would get for being a barbarian. So it's it's more about being an outsider. It's it's coming from a culture that people consider to be primitive, it has nothing to do with rage and combat ability or anything like that. Very, very interesting interpretation of of a barbarian. It talks about how, um, you know, they can, you can have demi humans, what they called demi humans back then, um, as barbarians. It also has a, a berserker. Okay. This is closer to what we would think of as being a barbarian is the berserker. These guys get like bonuses to, to combat and attacks. Okay. So, um, a little bit different, but it's kind of like splitting the barbarian and the berserker into two different things when we would consider them to sort of be one and the same now. So that's the complete fighter's handbook. So for a while, if you wanted to play a barbarian, you had to take this one until this is like 1980. I want to say this comes out the same year. It's I think it's 1989. This is by Aaron Alston, a uh, very famous um, RPG writer, also wrote a ton of Star Wars books and unfortunately passed away far too early. He was in his early 50s um, when he passed away. But I believe this comes out in 1989. Yeah. Okay. So that's the same year second edition comes out. However, 1995. So this has been, you know, second edition has now been out for about six years. You have the release of the complete Barbarian's Handbook. So what this does is it actually creates a Barbarian class. So um, rather than using a kit with a fighter, you're going to create a Barbarian fighter. And it gives you all the different qualifications here. You can only be human. It gives you different alignments. And interestingly, in this one, you can be lawful. Very interesting. Uh, it gives you, you know, the different characteristics and then what your level advancement is. And then what your abilities are, your armor and weapons um, that you can use. And then it talks about your abilities. You have back protection and leaping and springing. So that's going back to how it was described in first edition Unearthed Arcana and that article from Dragon 63. And it has climbing, right? So it's giving them some abilities. And then there's a shaman, which is sort of like playing a barbarian cleric. So that's in here as well as a separate class. So that's the complete barbarian handbook. This is a really great book. Um, it's again, it's a, it's one of the very later uh, second edition books that comes out. So this is 1995. TSR is going to be acquired by Wizards of the Coast in 1997. So, um, but there's a lot of fun stuff in here, especially at the back, uh, um, that you could apply to any game if you're playing a barbarian character. Um, barbarian cultures. See, and it just talks about social organization, economics, and stuff like that. So there's no there's no mechanics in here. So this could be used for any any game. Doesn't even have to be D and D. Okay, so that is 1995. Okay, so that's really the early history of the Barbarian class during the TSR era. So my videos are about history, and I know a lot of people on my channel consider history to be anything that's before the Watsi days. I get it, okay, but 
Uh, I am going to quickly go over some of the Watsi era stuff for Barbarians. I'm not going to get into the splat books or anything like that. I'm just going to stick with the core books and talk about how the Barbarian has changed over time. Okay. And it was a pretty significant change with third edition. Now, part of that was just because the rules changed pretty significantly. But this is cross keys considered like the um, like the official Barbarian of, um, of third edition. And uh, so really what you see here is this focus on rage which is the barbarian's key ability. So that just means that they, you know, they basically take a dexterity um, modifier, negative modifier to add a bonus to their strength when they're attacking, right? So they take like an AC um, a decrease. Okay, then they get fast movement, they get uncanny dodge, so dex bonus to their AC, um, even when you normally wouldn't get it. And then, you know, it, 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 it levels up, okay? Um, all these are third edition mechanics. But as you see, really, it's all based on combat, which is very common for third edition and beyond in D&D. So there's very little in here about cultures of, D of barbarians and different types, like you saw those ones before in the earlier editions where they talked about steppe barbarians or forest or jungle or, you know, sea raiders and all that kind of stuff. So this, this doesn't really cover that. This covers how are you going to interact in combat for the most part nothing against third edition i've played a ton of third edition I'm still running a you know faux 3e game that started with 3e and went through 3.5 and now we're running pathfinder 1e i kind of consider that all one system um so i don't have anything against this it's just it's very combat focused it's very you know that's just what the game is okay fourth edition 2008 so there is no um, barbarian class in this book. So that's an interesting change. So they put the barbarian in as a core class in this book. This was the first time the barbarian was a core class right out the gate in, in one of the um, editions, okay, in the player's handbook. This player's handbook doesn't have that. That's not going to come until the player's handbook two, okay? And in here, the uh, fourth edition is all about what kind of power source you have. And so the barbarian is said to have a primal power source. That means that there's some kind of primal energy that um, gives the barbarian their powers, okay? That's just how 4E works. Every class has a different power source. And um, they're, they are a striker type. Um, and every that's another thing that every class in 4E is, is kind of grouped into like, you know, a striker or, or a tank type or something like that, right? So these are strikers. And it does um, include sort of like a, a rage ability. It's a little bit different than we've seen before. They also get like some feral abilities and they get a rampage ability. And I'm not going to get into the mechanics of that, but, you know, they, they're kind of trying to keep some of that terminology alive. And then because it's 4E, you get 12 pages of powers, which are essentially like spells. So that's what this is. Again, nothing against 4E. I know a lot of people like this. I had fun the couple of times that I played 4E. I played it twice. Um, as one shots, and we just decided not to change my campaign to this. So again, I'm not, I'm not disparaging on 4E. I think it's a great game for what it is. I just think they probably would have done better had they called it something else other than D&D. It's a very tactical based board game. And for that, it's, it's not board game, but it's a tactical based game. And I think it's good at what it does. All right. And then last, we've got fifth edition. So 5E returns the barbarian uh, to the core um, character classes that are available. So it's now back in, um, you know, in, the, in this particular, uh, player's handbook. It's not, you know, in a, in a separate book. And you guys are all familiar with this, but you see, you've got rage and unarmored defense and things that are very kind of in line with what you saw in the 3E version. And that's really consistent with 5E. 5E is kind of I, I hate to say this, but it's almost sort of like a, a cleaned up and concise version of 3E or 3.5 and just kind of making it a little bit easier. There's a lot of differences, okay, but that's kind of uh, where it starts. There's way more in common between 5E and 3.5 than there is between 5E and 4E. All right, so that you've got your barbarian class in here, and then uh, you've got your fast movement. We've seen that before. You've got your feral instincts. You've got relentless rage. Okay, unarmored defense, all these things that are kind of similar to what we've seen in the history of the class. Now, mechanically, they work differently, but a lot of these concepts are coming out of the original ideas that we saw going all the way back to that article from Gary Gygax in 1982, Dragon number 63, but also even that unofficial class that we saw in White Dwarf number four and then the cleaned up version in number, uh, White Dwarf number 12. All right, so that's our look at the Barbarian 
throughout the history of um, the uh, game of D&D. So I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, I would really appreciate it if you could please like the video. And then also, if you haven't subscribed, could you please subscribe? I would super appreciate it. Um, it will help my channel to grow. And, th and then if you could share the video with other people, that's also the fastest and quickest way for me to grow my channel. All right. So um, I would love to hear what you thought about this video. Tell me what your favorite edition is for uh, Barbarian class, which version you think does it the best. Maybe you don't like Barbarians. Um, maybe you homebrewed your own version. Share all of that below in the comments. Also below, you'll find places where you can join me on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and on Twitter, uh, on Blue Sky. You can also check out my blog uh, and where I have a lot of you know, free content that mostly is uh, uh, system neutral. And you can also find a link to help support my channel by buying something from my shop. So holidays are coming up and I have tons of great designs for people that like um, role playing game influence designs. So T-shirts, hoodies, mugs, posters, whatever you want. I have it in, in, in my shop and you can uh, find that link below. OK, so again, that's it. And I'd like to say thank you so very much for watching and stay safe. Happy gaming. And I will talk to you next time. And now for the bonus content, this is what I was drinking and what I was listening to when I was working on my notes for this video. So there were a lot of notes in this one as I read through all those old articles. I had read most of them before uh, and the White Dwarf one and uh, Dragon, but it had been a while and I wanted to kind of refresh myself on those. So um, again, I took quite a few notes and I was uh, it's the Halloween season. So it's uh, currently it's October 24th. And uh, so I was drinking this. This is All Hallows Treat from Omegong Brewery. And uh, this is an Imperial Chocolate Peanut Butter Stout. Uh, and then it's kind of fun. They, they have all these fun drawings on here. But it talks about how essentially uh, you get the idea that this is meant to replicate having a peanut butter cup, like a chocolate peanut butter cup at your first Halloween, like the first time you'd remember having that. So I don't get a lot of peanut butter cups anymore because my daughter is unfortunately allergic to peanuts um, pretty severely. Um, I do get them at Halloween if someone accidentally puts one in her bag, but she's actually been very good about asking people like, hey, can I get something without peanuts in it? Um, but anyway, uh, this is a, a fun one. So it's very rich. There's some vanilla on the nose as well. Mm. Definitely get that peanut butter on the nose. It's it's quite strong. It, and I mean that in a good way because I like peanut butter. OK, so that's a big boy. It's a 7.6%. So this is not a, like a, you know, guzzling beer. This is like a, a, a sipping beer where you linger over it again while you maybe are making notes to make a video about D&D. &D. Okay, what I was listening to. So recently I've been revisiting uh, Ted Lasso. I went through and rewatched the entire series. And those of you who watched that show know in season three, there's an episode where um, they talk about Chet Baker and... Uh, so in that video, the song was Let's Get Lost. That's what they were using. Um, I actually don't own that particular album on vinyl. I only have it on CD. So I, I, I spun this one. This is Chet Baker Sings from the Riverside label in 1958. But um, it's got some classic jazz songs. Now, Chet Baker is traditionally a trumpet player. Those of you who know, um, know Chet Baker, he started out as a trumpet player. And then um, because he was a good looking guy, I mean, he's a good looking cat. So they um, wanted him to sing more because they thought that that could kind of, um, you know, elevate his brand at the time. So uh, he starts singing, not a classically trained singer. It's very obvious, but uh, he just has a kind of a very smooth voice that um, the girls went wild for. So um you've got a lot of classic songs here and um i like old devil moon which was another reason i put this on because again it's it's um the halloween season so that was a, a perfect song for that so a lot of great uh, sidemen on this kenny drew on piano and um you know on bass you've got either george morrow or sam jones depending on the track and then on drums classic jazz drummer philly joe jones or um danny richmond depending again on the songs so uh give chet baker a, a spin it's kind of a fun uh, you know, album to put on. Uh, I maybe prefer his trumpet playing more than his singing, but I do like both. All right. So uh, again, that's it. Thanks so much and uh, cheers and happy Halloween.